लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेलकम अगेन टू द बैंक ऑफ बरोड़ा चार बाग वी आर एट द सिक्सटीन एडिशन ऑफ द जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल ट्वेंटी प्रोटेक्टेड बाय डेट ऑल बनेगा स्वस्थ इंडिया इज अ वंडरफुल सेशन एंड दिस सेशन आई एम डिलाइटेड टू इंट्रोड्यूस लाइव बिटवीन लाइन्स अ जर्नी इन सर्च ऑफ द लॉस्ट लेवेंट इन अ टेल celebrating the plurist past of the middle east private diplomat journalist and author michael reticiotis traces history of his family caught between a clash of faith and identity lives between lines recounts life under the ottoman empire where communities with different creeds and origins thrived lasting among a century the ottoman oasis was disrupted by the european colonial order that caused violent conflict between the arabs and the jews of the region in conversation with historian william dalrymple vaticotus takes us through the history of his forebears as an ode to one tolerant and harmonious middle east michael vaticotus is a private diplomat a journalist and an author of fiction and non-fiction formerly editor of far eastern economic review michael is currently senior advisor at the center for humanitarian dialogue his latest book lies between the lines a journey in search of the lost levant explores his family's levantine roots and ladies and gentlemen william dalrymple is the author of wolfson prize winning white moogles Duff Cooper Prize winning The Last Mughal and Hemingway and Kapuscinski Prize winning Return of a King his book The Anarchy was shortlisted for the Duke of Wellington medal the Tata book of the year and the Historical Writers Association award okay as you wish william and uh, i invite upon the stage michael vaticiotis he will explain certain things to you and then the floor is between michael and william give them a big round of applause thank you this session may sound as if its subject matter is very far from anything relevant to india but the more i travel in the middle east and uh, in the levant the more the parallels between what happened in the 18th 19th and 20th centuries in the middle east with the break up of the ottoman empire uh, the closer it seems to me to be to what happened uh, in uh, in india with the break up of the mogul empire in both you had multinational multicultural multi faith societies operating under autocratic rule giving way to polarizing is perhaps the, uh, a better word polarizing into a series of different nationalisms um which were less inclusive but which um often appealed to the people at the time and just as in the uh, here in india hindu muslim sikh earlier buddhist jains uh coexisted uh under the different islamic dynasties uh so in the middle east you find that cohabitation giving way to polarization and just as it now seems almost impossible to get back uh to a delhi which is almost exactly 50-50 hindu and muslim uh, as was the case uh in the mid 80 mid 19th century so in the middle east uh it's impossible to today i was in alexandria for example a month ago it's now what is a 99% muslim town no cop so maybe a, a 90% muslim town but the egyptians the jews uh the all these the syrians the beirutis all these different trading communities that gathered in these multinational multicultural cities that world has gone the world of kavafi uh uh the world um of uh, of Lawrence Darrell of Justine uh, is totally lost to history 
just as much as the world of Ghalib is lost here. Michael is almost the complete embodiment of the Levant in one person. He has Jewish, Palestinian, Greek, and Italian blood. I've never actually met anyone that has all of those. <laughs> uh, and he is, he, he is like sort of walking into Alexandria. He is uh, in his blood like walking into Alexandria in, uh, in 1900 or uh, into Beirut uh, in 1850. This world where different worlds coincide, where different interests can be reconciled, uh, is something that Michael has in his genes and which he writes with passion about in this spectacular book which I recommend to you wholeheartedly, Li uh, Lives Between the Lines, A Journey in Search of the Lost Levant. Beautifully reviewed uh, in itself, if no nothing else at the end of this, even if you're not going to go and buy the book, go and look up Philip Mansell's gorgeous review in the FT. Uh Spectator. Spectator, which is a, a, the most wonderful uh, encapsulation of this book and the, and the lost world he describes. Philip Mansell being the man up to now who I've always gone to, um, to read about this. His Levant, published about 10 years ago, is another spectacular evocation of this world. And one, again, that Indian, Indian readers will find many echoes of their own experiences. Um, there's a lovely phrase that uh, Alex von Tunzelman uses in her book, Indian Summer. She talks about how the British made Indians tick boxes, uh, which made them forget the ambiguities of their blood and culture uh, and opt for binaries. There's something of that, I think, happening in the Levant too. Michael, you want to do a reading first, so I'm going to stop well, talking. And, and just wanted, yeah. on that point about fusion of uh, identity, I mean, I always remember a famous quote from Omar Sharif, who was actually uh, from Alexandria, um, who once said that, you know, because he was a mishmash of everything, um, that he could play any role because no one knew where he ever came from. <laughs> so um, I just want to set the scene a little bit because it's a, this is a book about my family and it's also a book about an era which is long lost, as, um, as uh, Willie just said. And, and first of all, thank you very much for having me here for my second uh, time at uh, uh, Jaipur. It's a great, great, great pleasure. Now, this book is a journey. It's my journey in search of a very brief era of cosmopolitan tolerance and prosperity in the Middle East that spanned a century from the mid-1850s exactly to the mid-1950s. I was born in 1957, just at the end of it. I embarked on this journey to discover why my Italian and Greek forebears migrated from Europe, from Europe to the Middle East, something most people today would consider very strange. Now, the era begins with the conception and construction of the Suez Canal, a feat of engineering that changed forever the flow of trade between Asia and Europe. It changed everyone's lives um, and made Egypt, for a brief period, one of the most in important centers of the world. I think it was Rudyard Kipling who said that if you wanted to meet anyone in the world, you would either go to Liverpool or Port Said. <laughs> Now, while everyone knows the role played by the French diplomat and dreamer Ferdinand de Lesseps, who promoted and raised funds for the canal in Europe, less recognized today is the remarkable vision of Muhammad Ali, the Albanian adventurer who became the Ottoman ruler of Egypt in 1805. Muhammad Ali believed that the only way to develop his new domain, and he had nothing to do with being Egyptian, was to harness the professional and technical skills of Europeans. It so happened that Europeans were willing to come. The reason? Europe was a complete mess. The mid-19th century was a period of perpetual war and upheaval across much of Europe. My mother's Italian family, and they were Jews from Livorno, which is next to Tuscany, joined the nationalist cause and fought for a unified Italy oh, with Garibaldi. My father's Greek family hailed from the island of Idra, in the Saronic Gulf of Greece, famous for spearheading the fireship campaign that helped defeat the Ottoman Empire and win Greek independence in 1832. The problem was that neither unified Italy or newly independent Greece 
were very secure places. And with the establishment of steamship lines across the Mediterranean, tens of thousands of Greeks and Italians, among them members of my family, migrated to Egypt and the coast of Palestine, ironically, where the Ottoman Empire, ironically, at least for the Greeks, offered security as it was undergoing a period of economic reform and transformation. And so the Sornagas, that's my mother's family from Livorno, washed up in the Nile Delta and established a cotton ginning business. They grew wealthy, very wealthy, because under the Ottoman capitulations, later the mixed courts, foreigners had the freedom to set up businesses and be defended in their own courts. They built lavish villas and were prominent in business. They were present at the grand opening of the Suez Canal and the opening night of Aida at the new Cairo Opera House. Meanwhile, my great-grandfather on my father's side left Idra at some point in the 1850s, a, an impoverished seaman, and washed up in the Crusader port of Acre on the, on the coast of Palestine, where he opened a ship's chandler's business and married a local Palestinian woman whose name was Ev Morfia. On the Sornaga side in Egypt, my great-great-grandfather was appointed general manager of the Cairo post office, which for, for a mysterious reason was an Italian monopoly. On the Greek side in Palestine, my grandfather and maternal grandfather's family drew close to the Greek Orthodox Church, which was a source of education and employment, as it controlled, and still does, sizable land holdings in all the major sites in what is today Israel. Two of my great-uncles, who were monks in the Holy Order of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, helped rebuild monasteries, historic monasteries, one of them on the site of the supposed baptism of Jesus along the River Jordan. Their lives were stable, secure, and largely fulfilling, even as Europe continued to struggle. And then, with the onset of European imperial rule in the Middle East, the so-called British Veiled Protectorate in Egypt and the British Mandate in Palestine, the problems began. The Ottomans were, of course, lazy administrators. They left people of these different communities, or as they called them, millets, to largely govern themselves. But the British drew lines, ticked boxes, and divided communities. General Edmund Allenby, when he marched into Jerusalem in 1917, a spectacle that my maternal grandmother witnessed, decreed that the Dome of the Rock should be off limits to non-Muslims. It had never been off limits to non-Muslims before. His planners were largely responsible for reinforcing and dividing the city into separate quarters. I should add that there is one British relative in the mix of my complicated family, and he was very much part of the colonial construct. So I can sort of share the burden of guilt and also be critical at the same time. Um, my maternal grandfather, a Welshman, fought and miraculously survived several trench campaigns in the First World War, including Passchendaele, and was sent to be Chief Secretary to Jack St. John Philby, the first resident in the newly established Transjordan, itself another product of arbitrary British line drawing. My grandfather, Dick Mumford, was witness to the casual iniquity of British colonial rule in the Middle East and left the service frustrated to join a shipping company in Portside where he met my maternal grandmother, Lydia Sornaga, the youngest of 12 children. My mother was born in Portside and grew up in Cairo. By the time we reached the 1930s, resistance to British rule has already led to violence and upheaval. The Arab revolt in Palestine, in 1930, and the, the rise of Egyptian nationalism under Saad Zaglul after 1921. This, I argue, was the start of what I call the Great Rupture of established Ottoman society and the start of the Middle Eastern conflict as we know it today. So perhaps we'll, I'll stop there where, and you can sort of ask me what happened next. Even before... <laughs> Even before we go uh, forwards, I'd love you just to talk a little bit more about Muhammad Ali, because Alexandria, which in a sense is such a fulcrum for this book and for the Levant, um, before him was apparently a city of only six or 7,000 people. It had shrunk from this... I mean, it had been something like this earlier. If you look at Ptolemaic 
Alexandria. We were there with my son Sam going down a catacomb uh, in Alexandria two weeks ago, and we and we saw this extraordinary mix of different worlds where Roman and Greek and ancient Egyptian were fusing. But that world had gone and shrunk to almost nothing. Muhammad Ali revived it miraculously from the dead. Well, he put his palace there in Rice. And one of the reasons I think he put his palace in Alexandria is because he just murdered all the Mamluks in, um, in Cairo. So I think the citadel in Cairo, where the murders took place, was probably a little bit off limits. So he moved he to a nice, nice mosque to commemorate the spot. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, it really is remarkable to actually see the influx of Europeans at this time. I mean, at some point, Alexandria had in excess of 300,000 Europeans, Greeks and Italians. And not just in Alexandria itself, the entire Nile Delta was um, you know, riddled with Greek, uh, you know, the, anyone who knows Australia knows that the Greeks used to run the milk stores, right? Well, in, 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 Alex, in the Nile Delta, the Greeks ran all the sort of little, little mom and pop stores, and they were the money lenders in the Nile Delta, but there were hundreds of thousands. Even when I went there first in the mid-1990s, there was still a, a Greek club in Alexandria, it, and it, there was still the survivors, little fragment of this world, but they're uh, no longer there, apparently. Yeah, it, well, there's a Greek restaurant, um, and there's one that... Christina. And there's one that no longer serves wine, unfortunately. But yeah, so it's, it's, it, that, that, that's all gone. It's, I mean, this is really a lost era. Oh. And tell me about your Palestinian uh, forebears, because again, you know, today, the Palestinians very much think of themselves as Arabs. Uh, and very much um, a part of the Arab nationalist movement as far as it still exists. But the Palestinians uh, that your family married into were in fact a multinational mixture of almost everything that had ever come through the Levant. There were crusader families who come back to crusaders. Some indeed were Arab. They were the Arab, uh, Arab tribes identified tribally, uh, but many did not and were from the coastal towns and, and had a huge mixture of different genes. It's very interesting you talk about this Arab identity. I mean, for instance, if you go to Bethlehem today, Bethlehem, a Palestinian town, um, they're, they're they really, you know, really resent the influx of the Bedouin Arab from the south, and they say these peasants, you know, yeah. these peasants, they're not, they're not like us. Great yeah. Sahot, too, yeah. and, so, and they're very posh, but, yes, old uh, Palestinian exactly. families. Exactly. Now, I think religion is the key, and also, as I mentioned earlier, this whole point of, of how the Ottomans managed the different communities. Once you were attached to a religious, mainly religious community, that was your community. So, for the Palestinians who were converted, and often the conversion to Christianity was driven by social economic um, uh, reasons. For instance, in my father's time, many Palestinians became Anglicans because, of course, the British mandate of Palestine was a, a source of employment. In the same way, many Palestinians became Greek Orthodox because the church, the Greek church, was so powerful for many centuries. So maybe, my maybe just yeah. s slip in there um, what we were talking about at lunch yesterday, how powerful in terms of land owning the Greek church still is in modern Israel. A third of the land, at least, of the state of Israel is owned by the Greek church on a 90-year lease. So the leases are almost up. And there's going to be a major asset to, because even the Knesset is, is, is actually owned by the Greek Orthodox yeah. Church. So, so, the, so my great-grandmother, Evmorphia, she has a Greek name because she was a Greek Orthodox. And in the, Greek, in the minds of the Greek Orthodox Church, if you were Greek Orthodox, you were Greek. Doesn't matter where she was, she was actually from Galilee somewhere, but doesn't matter. You were Greek, and you became a Greek by becoming Greek Orthodox. And likewise, if you were a Catholic, you were a Latin. You were a Latin, exactly. Yeah. So this very, very varied Palestinian community was based on where you were in which region. So, it sorry to br it bring this parallel with this part of the world again, but there's a, a discussion very much on this subject in Aisha Jalal's book, Self and Sovereignty. And she notes how in the 18th and 19th century, how many um, poets in the Mughal Empire identify themselves by their city. So you have somebody Akbar Abadi or somebody else Delvi, uh, if they're from Delhi. Uh, and people identified not by religious community, uh, or, uh, or, or the color of their skin or caste, but by their city. And their, their, their mode of identification uh, lay with... Uh, is that the case? That well, it's, in, in it's interesting Bible? because my conceptual sort of view of cosmopolitanism, and it was actually my father's theory that actually the, that the source of cosmopolitanism was actually Alexander the Great. Because if you remember in, in ancient Greece, everyone did define themselves by which city they came from. And the city was the state. But when he created the empire across Asia, he realized that was an unworkable 
a formula. And so what he said is that, well, we can't possibly run this empire on the basis of identity in each city. So we'll just create this cosmos, the world, which is ours. And that went through the Byzantines through to the Ottomans. And so the Ottomans didn't have a sense of place. It was entirely a sense of which community you belong to, and you are responsible for your affairs. And, and in law, the millet system, so if you, if you were caught stealing and you were a Greek, you went to the Greek court. You went to the Greek court. Now, this, the capitulations was actually critical for the wealth and prosperity of this Levantine society. Explain what the capitulations so are. So the capitulations originated, I think, in the 16th century with the French and other Europeans who went to uh, the Grand Port, as it was called, Constantinople. And it was a, it was a concession to trade. Um, and it was, you, could, you, could evade, you could avoid being held responsible in, under Ottoman law. And that then carried through to the 19th century where it became the mixed court system, where, as you rightly point out, people had the right to be defended in their own courts. They could keep their own citizenship. So my Italian family in Greece, uh, in Egypt, remained Italian, you know, all the time. I mean, th this is a part of the problem why they never integrated. They, they, it, was, it was actually better to be Italian and Greek and at the same time, as European nationalism, modern nationalism in the 20th century started to sort of rise and people started to claim them as citizens. Because don't forget, in the 19th century, citizen, citizenship was a vague concept. It was a piece of paper, you know. And do you, I mean, in this part of the world, people have, have often tended to blame the colonial authorities and uh, only the, in this discussion about this B BBC documentary, there was reference to the policy of divide and rule. But it seems to me that in the 18th and 19th century, you get nationalisms growing of their own organic, it's, I mean, because no one's promoting this, this polarization whereby Bulgarians, who were very happy to think of themselves as Ottoman citizens for 150 years, suddenly become Bulgarian nationalists. Serbs become Serb nationalists. In a way, you Greeks can become Greek nationalists and can feel suddenly they can no longer coexist with Turks. I mean, the most, in a way, the most destructive force that tore apart the Ottoman Empire was precisely this modern nationalism, where the Turks realized we'd better become Turkish. And, and of course, that offended the rest of the empire. I mean, the reason why the, Maghrebi, uh, uh, the, the um, Hijazi Arabs in the Hijaz joined the British uh, and, and the, the Arab revolt um, under Lawrence was because they were fed up with the Ottomans because they started to impose taxes, they were bringing railways and all this modern stuff of nationhood. They rejected it. And they went, why can't we go back to the old days when you're just far away in Constantinople and we send the odd bit of tribute? And they'd be very happy to blow up the Baghdad railway. <laughs> so, so I think, but coming to the 19, you know, onto the 1930s, I mean, this, as I said, the rupture, um, it really was the rise of this rather virulent nationalism in Europe that started to claim uh, the citizens of, you know, the far-flung citizens, the Italians, for instance. Mussolini would visit Africa. He was trying to take Abyssinia. He visited Egypt. You know, they had to, they sort of put a claim on the Italians, you know, who'd never been to Italy or went maybe once in five years. Um, similarly with the Greeks, with the rise of Venizelos in the, in the 19... You know, the, the, the Greek nationalism started to claim the Greeks. And how did your family, who were, even by Levantine's standards, a, a fantastic cocktail, how did they fare in this? You, this is a sense where we kick in from where you... Yeah, so that badly. Um, my Italian family, Jews, were pro-Mussolini. Not an easy one to reconcile in retrospect. And I think the reason for it is because they were, they were, they were, non -up, they were fierce, um, defenders of the Italian monarchy, because don't forget they'd fought for Garibaldi, they'd fought for unification, they, 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 were, they were loyal to the Italian, the new Italian state. When Mussolini came along, of course, he was a royalist too. And, and let's not forget that, you know, while the Nazis made no secret of their anti-Semitism, it was a little bit more um, ambiguous, ambiguous in fascist. Italy. Yeah, and, and of course, if you go to the, the ghetto in Rome, it's full of plaques of all the Italians who helped the Jews. And if, historically, that's correct. However, my mother did have two second cousins who made the fatal mistake of going back to Italy in 1943, just as the, the Germans uh, occupied Florence. And that changed everything. And that changed everything. And, you know, they didn't realize what they were walking into. I mean, let's face it, many parts of Europe didn't know what was going on. Um, the Holocaust was not understood. And, and only one of the authors who sadly didn't get a visa at the last minute or didn't get a flight at the last minute, Johnny Friedland, was, right, going, to, yes. was going to be talking yes. um, about his book, The Escape. 
escape artist of Auschwitz. And the importance of that story was that the, the one Jewish guy who did break out of Auschwitz was the one who got the news out about the it. News out. It had been a perfectly kept secret. People knew that the Jews were being deported, but they didn't know where they were going or what was happening to them. And the, and, and the Germans, I mean, it's fair to say Italians resisted a lot of the deportations. Nonetheless, my, my mother's two second cousins, Aldo and Alda, Alda um, were hounded by the Mafia because they were Jews and threatened with being, um, you know, handed over to the Gestapo and sadly... For, for money? For money, for money, because they had a business. Um, sadly, they committed suicide as a result. They strangled their three-year-old daughter and uh, slit their wrists. And it's a sort of celebrated story in the area, well, you know, uh, tragedy. And the guy who actually um, blackmailed them uh, did go to jail. After, the, after, after the in the 1950s, so so they had no consciousness, at least until my, my father recollects the war in, in in Haifa. The Arabs again were pro Axis. They were pro Hitler because they saw Hitler as essentially kicking out the British from Palestine. Um, and um, I think they kind and of the British by that stage were associated with the Zionist settlements. They had started yeah. to be drawn in. The Arab revolt was put down extremely brutally by the British. Explain, explain the, that Arab revolt. When Jewish Americans begin to flood into Palestine, um, many Palestinians are being thrown off their land to make room for the new kibbutzes and so on. And this is where, and, and, this is and, where and the Palestinians rise up and are then not only are their leaders taken away, often interred in Cyprus, but they're disarmed. Disarmed and, and, and actually quite harshly treated. I mean, to be fair, the British also treated members of the Haganah and the Stern Gang very harshly too. And don't forget, the, the members of the Stern Gang took out a British governor in Cairo. Um, so, I mean, there was violence on both sides. But my father recollects this era as a sort of bomb throwing. The, the community started to polarize. It's at this point that the communities start to polarize. The Jews coming into Haifa, and Haifa was, of course, one of the most cosmopolitan cities, or modern cities, I should say. It was the trading port where the oil came in from Iraq. There was a new refinery. And the Jews famously threw away their passports on arrival. Well, yeah. they, they essentially started to live in their own areas. And that's the first time in the region that you have this kind of differentiation of communities. The Arabs started to resent that. Um, there was violence. The, the, the Arab revolt, as they call it, I mean, it's, it's a Palestinian revolt, but it's called the Arab revolt. It was led by a famous preacher from Haifa, um, uh, and, you know, very charismatic. And then the British went into the hills. They used air power. Uh, General Wingate um, was one of the... One of the he was uh, very pro-Zionist. Pro-Zionist. Apparently, he'd attack an Arab band, and then he would sit naked on a chair munching an onion. Um, you see, uh, has this sort of... Uh, <laughs> I have another story, if I hope it doesn't discuss anyone, of him recruiting people for his... his uh, um, sitting in an open dressing gown, again naked, yeah. combing himself with a toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> the British were strange. Lord <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, Wingate was, I think, the strangest of, of, among many. But so, so this yeah. the, the polarization begins. The communities start to uh, fight each other, look at each other with malice. My father remembers having to run past certain shops. Um, he was blown up in a bus um, uh, by an Arab uh, uh, a bomb bomb thrower. Uh, managed could to survive. Could have been a bomb from someone else. Yeah. So, so you know, and he remembers. His father, the sadness of his father, who was from Acre, you know, just the sadness of that beginning to see the communities that had lived together so well all these, you know, centuries really, um, beginning to fall apart. And in Alexandria, your did did all the the, the previously settled um, Italian Jewish family in Alexandria, did they all go back to Italy or were there others who, because in the Alexandria Quartet, Lawrence Darrell, um, you have the characters like Justine who are uh, Alexandrian Jewish, very much settled in Alexandria, but they feel the call of the Zionism um, it's interesting, there, 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 there's some very good writing on this by um, Jewish writers from Egypt and, and, and they're torn between wanting to remain cosmopolitan wanting to remain part of that pluralistic milieu, but at the same time being drawn to the Zionist cause, and ultimately some of them rejecting it and saying, no, 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 you know, we grew up with this tolerant, 
cosmopolitan existence, we don't want to be just on one Andrew, side. Andre Asiman, another friend yes, of the Andrew festival, Asiman, being an yeah. example of that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Out of Egypt, a wonderful memoir as well. From so then, uh, I think, then what happened during the war is, of course, the British interned the Italians. I mean, eight to 10,000 Italians were put in miserable camps, you know, close to the Nile, uh, on, the, on, on the other side, of, on the eastern on, sorry, on the eastern side, um, including some of my relatives. And, and so the British were suspicious of the Italians. And the British, at the same time, in Egypt, weren't quite sure where they were going. If they had, you know, don't forget, Rommel almost succeeded in taking um, Cairo. Um, he, gets to, he gets to the sea oasis, doesn't he? He gets, he gets to the sea oasis, and there's Al Alamein, and he's, you know, thrown back. But at the time, it was, you know, people were being evacuated to Palestine. And my, my grandfather was basically told to evacuate. Um, he wouldn't go because of his Italian family. Uh, so they, they almost made it. And of course, the, the Arabs were cheering the, the Germans on. Um, people were you know, decorating with flags in Alexander, expecting Rommel to arrive. Mussolini famously arrived on a plane with a white horse, um, hoping to ride triumphantly into Alexandria. And when he saw that things were going the wrong way, he just flew right back. I didn't know that story. <laughs> And so, how, so by the 1950s, what's happened to your family? So then we get to the end of the war, and I think this is the, the, the major sort of turn and inflection point after the war is, of course, the, what the Palestinians call the Nafka, the, the 1948 the catastrophe. Decision, the catastrophe, the 19, you know, the decision to create the state of Israel. Immediately, as far as my family is concerned, and many, many people from Palestine, the Greeks from Palestine, many rich Palestinians, they, flew, they fled to Egypt, essentially. Well, fled to Lebanon and also to Egypt. Including Edward Said's family, for example. Edward Said's family. My father was, uh, uh, at current, he was at the University of Ca American University of Cairo, um, and he suddenly saw this influx of rich Greeks, rich Palestinians. Those with the means left. Um, at his, you know, his major um, angst in all this was his friends, because he was at school in Haifa, um, an Anglican school, with um, many of the founders of the Palestinian movement, um, who were all Protestants. I mean, Wadi Haddad, George Habash, um, these, these people who founded, went on to found the PFLP, were his schoolmates. And they all went north to Beirut because they were from rather richer families. And so the rich... George Havash was at school with your... Yeah, and, and, and Wadi Haddad, the, the famous hijacker. So, um, and that, you know, he, they were his close friends. Uh, and so throughout his life, I think he always had this kind of soft spot for the, for the, for the hard men of the Palestinian cause. Were, were heroes in their day, in the eyes of the Palestinians. Yeah, they came from very rich families and they're very well educated, and they would have gone on to become medical doctors. Just like indeed many of the the, 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 the terrorists of the Stern Gang and so on were, were heroes of the young Israel and, and it's became a, prime ministers of Israel. And it's at this point that my father decides in 1948 that it's all the game is up. He's not going to be able to remain. The Greeks, the the Italians, they can't remain any longer because. This is the other thing, they never really integrated. I mean, my father perhaps was quite integrated because he spoke Arabic like a native. He was, you know, he had many, many, many friends. Andre Asman said he spoke Kitchen Arabic. Yeah, no, but my mother spoke Claudia Kitchen. Rodin yeah. spoke Kitchen Arabic. The Italians in Egypt didn't speak Arabic. The Greeks in Palestine, more of them did. And, you know, he, um, he recalls, uh, actually, uh, uh, being uh, torn, you know, whether, you know, he wanted to go back. My grandfather... Uh, on, on the Greek side, arrived in Greece, and he wrote a resume uh, in 1954. He worked at the end of the Manda, at the end of the, the, he worked for the railways. He was at the, the Palestine railways, and then the British, when they left, the Israelis wound up the Palestine railways. And so for a while, he worked for the decommission of the mandate. Um, when he got to Greece in 1954, he wrote on his resume that he was a refugee. So he was a Greek, pure, well, half Palestinian, half Greek, who'd never set foot in Greece, and yet this was the only country that would take him, and he saw himself as a refugee from his homeland. And was he recognized in Greece as, a, as, a, as an outsider? I think he, you know, I knew him quite well. He died only in, in 1992, at the age of 92. Um, and, you know, he had, a British citizen, he had a British passport all his life because he worked for the mandate, never set foot in the UK, never wanted to. My father tried to get him emigrated to the United States. He refused. <laughs> it's a complicated history within Greece. When you go, for example, to Crete today, half the population there are refugees from Anatolia. Right. And the, the, the Cretan Cretans, who've been there for generations, call the 
the incoming Greeks from Anatolia Turks, although they're Christian and speak Greek and, and so on. And, and often there's still crop burnings and, and uh, conflagrations at night when the two communities attack each other. I mean, this raises the larger issue of this identity, I think. You know, I'm, I was, I, as I sort of went on this journey and started to think about Levantine identity, it's really hard to define because it's not a culture. It's, it's not a thing. It's not a community. It's, as, I, as I'd say in the book, it's a milieu. It's a place. It's people who identify with certain things. And the problem with it, unlike some of the communities in this part of the world, is that they, there is no indigenous anything. It's, it's European, essentially. European mannerisms, culture. Everyone spoke French. And even today, when you go to Alexandria, you still have the, the names of the Pastrudis and all the different shops are still very, very multinational. It was essentially, you know, mid-19th century French bourgeoisie sort of artifacts, objects. If you go to Cairo today, to the, the houses of the upper middle class, it's all Louis XVI furniture and flock wallpaper. And they all speak French. And they all speak French. Yeah. And there were, this, I mean, it wasn't unique to, I was like, this was true of Beirut, this was true originally of Smyrna, before the burning of Smyrna. Uh, so Dema parts of Damascus, certainly Homs and, and, uh, and, and Aleppo, Aleppo, certainly, um, and uh, Haifa, I would say. Although the, the British were very successful uh, during the mandate, because they very much imposed an Anglosphere on Palestine. Um, there's no French in, in Palestine, uh, in Israel. They, uh, uh, yeah. It's all you know, English if they speak. A, a, you find um, Italian Franciscans. And Armenians, uh, lots of Armenians. Um, so I think that that sort of after, when I thought about this, what is the Le Levantine sort of milieu, it's very much an era and a, and a, and a, and a group of places with people who molded themselves according to that fashion rather than identified with it. So where does that leave you? You went to an English public school, you were brought up in, uh, in England, but you haven't settled in England. You've ended up in Singapore. I, you know, I think as I reflected on it, I was never comfortable. There, there's this wonderful, it's, it, I, it's not me who coined it, but there's this wonderful phrase used by a British writer he, um, where he described the mind of the Levantine as a committee. Um, never quite deciding, <laughs> you know, who they are, and always being able to fit into different places. By the way, which I, th I think I'm quite good at. Do you have the languages? I, I have some Arabic and, and some Greek. M my wife is francophone, so she deals with the French. Um, and uh, but I, I, having to the point about growing up in England, it was a great source of frustration to me that when we arrived in England, I was the age of ten from the United States. I, I was never really encouraged to learn the languages of my parents because you had to conform so much. You write rather movingly that you, you, you still miss the cooking. <laughs> that in Singapore, you can't get good, uh, good Levantine Yes, food. it's interesting. They've recently in, um, in Jordan, they've opened a restaurant that calls itself Levantine. So I rushed in. I said, <laughs> what's the food? What's yeah. the food? It's Armenian. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Yeah. Good. But it, it, it is, I mean... It, Some of the best restaurants in, in uh, the old city of Jerusalem. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a sad, for me, it's a sad sort of lament in a way, this, this book. It's, it's, a, it's a lost era. It is slowly being revived, though. Um, you know, the Jordanians, well, the Syrians. Well, there's, the, there's a sort of... Dubai is multinational in that way. Not Levantine, though. It's not Levantine, but it is multinational. It's, it's, cos it, it's a form of cosmopolitanism yeah. driven by money. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's interesting in the Levant, as they say in Arabic, al-Mashrik, there is a move now to try and use that old Levantine milieu, um, cosmopolitan, Arab-speaking, but also drawing on the historical experiences that they had, both in terms of nationalism, but also culture, to try and form the basis for a regional organization that keeps out the others, you know, the... Where, where is this? I haven't... Jordan. Seen. Jordan. Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. That's how they would define the Levant yeah. now, today. Well, I mean, one of the kind of weird inversions of this century is that the, the rich areas of the 19th century were the coast, Alexandria. Maybe as far inland as Cairo, but it, uh, and, and up the, the coast of Palestine, yeah, and just uh, and up the coast of Palestine. Of course, in the twenty-first century, in twentieth century, with the discovery of oil, it's places that those people would have thought barbarians. The the, the people of the Hejaz, people from the outer uh, that have the money and have spread the a very different culture. It's, it's, Wahhabi Islam yeah. of uh, of the Saudis is a very different thing that none of your ancestors would have been. Well, and they wouldn't have. Yeah. And in fact, 
on my, grand my Greek grandfather's side, he had cousins who eventually migrated to Kuwait and disappeared into the Arab world as Kuwaitis without any sense of a sort of mixed heritage. And they were completely absorbed. Uh, but you will remain in, in Singapore? Do, can you see yourself um, returning to Amman or, or Alexandria? Or, Increasingly uh, doing some work there. But, you know, I, I do find that the difficult thing about being in that part of the world is you get so wrapped up in the emotional um, distress it's very of the conflict. It's very upsetting. I, after From the Holy Mountain, which incidentally begins... And your book was such a <laughs> help to me on the religious side. Well, it begins in the monastery that your great-grandfather rebuilt. Well, my, my great-uncle Leontius... Um, well, there were two. There was Maximus, who lived in a cave. And he was brought out of the cave in a basket to come down and defend the holy sites of a blunderbuss. Leontius was a bit more of a cultured man, and he discovered this, this, the ruins of this monastery, which is where the three magi, uh, and your... your and where, where John Moscus, John the Moscus the, uh, uh, is buried. buried. And the grave is there still, and venerated. And, and today, it's filled with Romanian and Russian pilgrims, not one single Greek. Um, so he rebuilt, and... and You've got Greeks in Masaba still. Masaba, yes. Um, they rebuilt these monasteries, and this is a little interesting story, because the reason why the Greeks did all this monastery building at, at the turn of the century is because they'd all been destroyed over various invasions. Dalka, yeah. St. Gerasimus, yeah. Jericho. The Catholics and the Protestants were arriving, so they needed to stake out the real estate. And so the call went out to Mount Athos and also parts of Greece. If you were rich and had money, come to the Holy Land, invest the money in rebuilding the monasteries. And it's beautifully done. I mean, we've been to Abbot Theodosius. It's beautiful. Uncle, great uncle Leontius allegedly, I have a picture of him laying the, the foundation stone of the new, the new monastery. But ironically, a lot of the places where the monasteries are now Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And, and you had a very nice little story from the, from the Metropolitan. Oh, it's sad. I mean, if you approach this monastery now, you go through this sad, sad area, these no man's lands, these places where you can't get through and where the, the communities have been disrupted. I mean, and the wall has been built. wall has been built. And even, you know, around that monastery today, there are Bedouin settlements and it's, you know, very hard Muslim. It's, yeah, it, it's extremely sad. And what was it that the, uh, the, the Catholicos said to you about... Uh, uh, so... In the course of the research, and I think this is my favorite interview in the entire journey, I was managed to get a, an audience with His Holiness, um, the Patriarch in Jerusalem, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, Theophilus. And we were to, and the, it actually, we, there was almost no introduction to this. He said, you know, the Jews, they dig, and they dig, and they dig, and all they find is evidence of the Greeks. We were here first. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please make a big round of applause and please go and buy Lives Between the Lines. We have three minutes for a few minutes. That hand has come straight up. Give this man a microphone, please. Thank you, uh, thank you for being such a great uh, session. Hello, are you able to... Yeah, yeah. Hold it closer. Hello, yeah. Hello. Yeah. are you able to hear me? Yes, yeah. So, uh, Mike, I just want to know that uh, what are the challenges you faced uh, while digging out uh, and tracing out the roots of your family in a world that has completely changed and it's almost a gone world. So, what are the exact challenges you faced? Mr. Dalrymple has al already uh, has done a lot of works in tracing histories back and uh, he knows a lot uh, by primary sources. But digging out the family roots is uh, what are the primary sources and how did you uh, found it, find it? Very briefly, I used yeah. some family documents. Um, I had uh, a, a couple of uncles who were very generous in terms of telling me their narrative history of the family. On the ground, though, and it was a journey, I have to say, and I've lived in Southeast Asia for almost 40 years, and I'm used to people being very um, hard to uh, uh, gain trust with. It takes time. But when I got to Palestine in search of my great-grandfather's grave in Acre, the entire Palestinian community rushed to help me. You know, almost immediately they said, no, we have to help you find this grave. I said, but I don't know you. No, 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 no. we're doing this now for you. So people were extremely helpful um, and in Egypt too. So there was no trouble gaining trust. You know, uh, a trust in this part of the world is hard to gain. Um, as long as you were recommended by someone else to someone else, it was very easy. 
it's also true that in the Middle East, unlike the further east you go, the stones survive. Whatever was built is all still there. So I was able to retrace the homes, the factories, the places where they lived, my father's old apartment in, in, in Acre, which is still in Haifa, which is still there. Everything has, nothing has been removed. Behind the lady with the sunglasses. To, to, to your left. Yeah. Hello. Good afternoon, Michael. Uh, I just want to ask, was your family ever pressurized when you they were in Palestine to change their religion? It's a good question. I can answer it very quickly. My grandfather, who would have loved to have stayed in, in Palestine, he was, saw himself as a son of the soil, um, A, could not have a job in Israel because he wasn't Jewish and therefore couldn't join the trade union, and B, was simply told, there's no room for you here. You know, at that point, in 1949-50, um, they were not hiring non-Jews um, because they were trying to establish the state of Israel. I mean, it's changed since then. He just felt he wouldn't have a job. And much the same thing would have been would have happened to him had he been in Nasser's Egypt or in Nasser's Egypt. The, it was the fault of the Italians and the Greeks really for not trying. There were, for instance, Greek communists and socialists who wanted to stay in Nasser's Egypt. But of course, for Nasser himself, it was a great nationalist cause to say it's Egypt for Egyptians. Yeah. This lady here with a very nice shawl. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, I can't hear myself. No, you can. Yeah. We can hear you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for the compliment. Much needed. <laughs> uh, I did hear your talk, and uh, you speak of a system where we're all very closely knit because of the religion. Uh, that's really great, I suppose. Different religions. Different religions. Oh, we, st we, we all belong to different religions, yet we stick together. Fantastic. It doesn't get better than that. Uh, but in the times that we are today in, uh, there is no religion. There is no community. There is no backing anyone. It's all... S I stand here alone. I'm not saying take pity on me or anything of that sort. But I've come out of religion. I don't want religion. That's not the case in the Middle East. Well, so the, yeah. uh, but there's one thing that you're driving at, because what saddens me a little bit about what's happened in uh, particularly Israel um, is that we're moving away from differentiated religious communities to differentiated ultra-nationalist groups. Right. Yeah. Whether it's on the Palestinian side, or, uh, you know, uh, Hamas, uh, Hamas side, for instance, yeah. or on the, on, the, on the Jewish side. I mean, it's unrecognizable. It's ultra-nationalism. It's, it's fanatical. What's just the, the parties that have just won the election? And it's, it's all about mass and mobilization. And, and, you know, the rise of Islamism. It's not even about tradition anymore. The traditions are trampled underfoot. When you go to a Kyrene home, you see pictures of Granny sitting in 1950s by a swimming pool in a bikini. You see her daughter uh, wearing. Uh, <laughs> you see her daughter uh, wearing a shawl like yours, and you see her granddaughter hijabed up to. Uh, and so, yes, in the, however you interpret that, it's uh, uh, the, there has been a revival of religious identity. We don't have religion in the old sense. But identity is now formed by. Uh, anything that the can, archives, I suppose. <laughs> anything that can be mobilized and create polarization is what we have today. Yes, but aren't we fighting against it? This polarization is more of a coming together than really. Anyways, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank end, you really. so much. Anyone got an optimistic question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Can't have> <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please a big round of applause. Thank you. We would like to thank William Dalrymple and Michael Viticiotis for being here and for this riveting discussion on uh, 11 roots. Thank you so much.